event titled Women's Leadership Training, Innovations in India, Kenya, and Transylvania. IWC is a nonprofit organization in special consultative status with the UN Economic and Social Council, focusing on global women's rights and empowerment. Led by Unitarian or Unitarian Universalist women from around the world, IWC advances equity for women and girls worldwide through leadership development, empowerment programs, advocacy, and resources. If it partners with women's groups and other grassroots groups, organizations, and NGOs to implement locally based programs. Current and past programs have included Bolivia, Hungary, India, Kenya, the Philippines, Romania, Uganda, and the United States. Please go on our website, intlwomensconvo.org to find out more. The moderator of today's event is Phyllis Marsh. Phyllis Marsh attended the first IWC convention convocation in Houston and served on IWC's board for six years beginning in 2012. She has a background in legislative advocacy for fair laws and was a leader in her Maryland UU Churches partnership with UU Churches in the Philippines to support economic development projects for women. So I will turn it over to you, Phyllis. Thank, thank you, Karen, and um, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are joining uh, us from. Welcome, and we appreciate that you have chosen to spend your time with us this morning. In our time together, we are going to explore the idea of leadership development and training for girls and women. Leadership of course, may be defined in many different ways. And leadership for women may mean something totally different than leadership for men. After defining it, developing a program to enable it requires a lot of understanding and innovation and will of course, depend upon the culture in which it is taught. Today, we will look at three different creative models of developing leadership for girls and women in three different uh, parts of the world. If you have any questions of the speakers as you are listening, we ask you to put them in the chat box. And if there is time at the end, uh, we will get to them to see if we can, can answer your questions. We begin in Kenya with a story about support for education for girls. One of the things I heard this week that has stuck with me throughout all of the sessions that I have attended is the powerful statement, uh, simple statement made by UN Secretary General Guterres at the very beginning that empowered girls become empowered women. That's a simple statement, but I think it needs to be uh, repeated often. Our speaker from Kenya is Noelle Latomia. She works to empower young girls from a disadvantaged backgrounds in rural Kenya to access education through provision of scholarships, menstrual hygiene management training, sexual reproductive health and rights training and life skills. She has over 10 years experience moving projects on gender and women's issues towards success. She is a community solutions program alumni and an African American change maker cohort two alumni. So we welcome Lutomia uh, to tell us her story. I mean, I'm sorry, Noel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and hello, everyone. My name is Noel Lutomia from Kenya, and um, I don't know. Uh, um, are my slides 
Can I please have someone share my slides? Okay, hang on one sec. Um, okay. <laughs> Is it this one or this one? I have two sets, it looks like. There's oh, that's one. just your biography. Okay. Yeah, this one CSW. Okay. Uh, okay, KCSW. All right. Um, let's see. Um, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So Akeshin Kenya is uh, registered in the US, though we work in Kenya, and uh, Kenya <coughs> is located in uh, East Africa, the one labeled in red, and uh, Mumias is in uh, the western part of Kakamega, the smaller part. That is where we work. And then I'll give a brief background about the, please, the, the previous slide, please. Oh, I don't know how to go back. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'll give a brief about, uh, you know, I'll give a brief about uh, the education oh. center in Kenya. Okay. So the, the third slide. Slide number three, please. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Is this is three, isn't it? Or no? I'm not even seeing the slide. Oh, this one. Oh, the slides oh. are not up. You, you, oh, hang on. Me a screen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Let me. Oh, my goodness. Let's. See here. Okay. There we go. You see now? Yes. So okay. you, you need to go back a few steps. Okay, there we go. All right. This one. Thank you. Thank you. So Kenya has a population of around 47 million people as of uh, the 2019 census. And uh, girls, uh, girls in Kenya are facing a lot of problems going to school, and we can see from the statistics that every year about 13,000 Kenyan girls drop off of school due to unplanned pregnancy. And uh, that was worsened during COVID-19 because in Kakamega County alone, we had over, uh, around 8,000 girls who are pregnant, and uh, we do not uh, exactly have the current status of how many girls went back to school after COVID-19. And then another issue we're having that hinders girls from accessing education is poverty. And uh, the, the unemployment rate is very high. And in rural areas, that is worsened because people who used to work in cities have now come back to the villages because they are no longer employed. That means that their families are also at a disadvantage and uh, most families prefer to educate their boys because they assume that we will remain with the boys within the homestead and the girls will be married off so they will be taken care of by their husbands. And then we also have another problem of period poverty where girls are forced to transact sex for fun. So the men force girls into sex so that they can buy them. Uh, sanitary towels. That is also another big challenge we are facing, especially in rural areas where girls cannot, uh, you know, engage in uh, actively in any income generating activities. So they lose out by sleeping with men and then they get infected with uh, diseases such as HIV and AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, and then we have, uh, we also have a problem of retrogressive cultural practices where during funerals, especially in Western Kenya, girls are forced to attend uh, something called disco matanga. So when someone dies, we have this like a disco where the girls are forced to dance with men so that they can raise money to enable the diseased family raise enough money to uh, have a 
burial ceremony for the person who died. So these girls are forced to go from home to home to engage in that act. And then in the process, they end up with older men who end up raping and defiling them. Um, that is one of, that is in Western Kenya. And then uh, generally in some communities in Kenya practice female genital mutilation. And uh, that also, once you're circumcised, uh, according to those to those traditions, you're ready for marriage. And this happens for girls who are between maybe 10, 10 to 15 years. And uh, once you're circumcised, you're forced into marriage by your family because they, they, they get cows in return as dowry. Um, and then uh, statistics also, also show that young women aged uh, 15 to 19 are three times more likely to become infected with HIV than men. And uh, the reason, the most recent statistics released during COVID-19 show that one in four girls get, uh, you know, get infected with HIV uh, because they do not know anything about se uh, sex their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And uh, so they can't go to hospital to get checked, get help. Uh, then COVID-19 has worsened the whole scenario of education in Kenya because girls had to move from cities to rural areas in order to, you know, in rural areas, at least you know, the farming community, girls could access food. But uh, then there is the problem of school fees and school uh, utilities. The next slide, please. So Akishi in Kenya was founded in uh, 2005 by Joyce Moore, who is an American woman from Boston, and uh, Sami Lutumia, who comes from Mumias. They came together and founded Akishi in Kenya, whose mission is to support and increase the education, health, and well-being of girls in rural Kenya. The next slide, please. Here we go. So part of Vacation Kenya's programs include uh, offering a comprehensive high school and university scholarships, menstrual hygiene management, products and education, sexual and reproductive health and rights training, organic, organic farming training. And then uh, recently, as of last year, we had a COVID-19 response program. Uh, please, the next slide so I can go into the details of what we do in each of the programs. So the Kishin Kenya program started uh, in, uh, in uh, 2010, and so far we have uh, supported more than 100 girls through high school and uh, more than 20 girls through university education. And uh, most of our girls, thank you, most of our girls are the first ones in their families or even in their whole generations to go through high school. And uh, as you can see in the photos on the right, that is Mr. Mungai and his daughter Saida. Mr. Mungai had barely gone through primary school education and none of the family members had gone into her high school. So Saida made them very proud to go through high school and then she went through a diploma course and persevered and went, to, went through a, uni, a university degree. That is how come you can see the father dressed in a, in a graduation gown because he's very, very proud that a girl from his family could go to school and pursue education up to degree level. And it's a very good show for the community. And we also support girls in STEM best subject because locally we know most girls assume that uh, science best subjects are, are only meant for boys. And you will hear sometimes hear them saying my boyfriend or my future husband is in a certain boys school studying for the sciences. So I do not need to put in so much effort. So Akisha in Kenya is also supporting uh, the STEM-based subjects at St. Elizabeth Loreco High School. And then uh, on the right, you can see some of our sponsored girls who hold leadership positions because of the mentorship and continuous guidance we give them. Thank you. The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, another one of Akashia and Kenya's flagship projects is uh, the menstrual hygiene management education and training, where we aim at breaking the silence around menstruation. It is a taboo topic 
amongst the lawyer people where we work. People rarely talk about menstruation and the such girls have left with the, no people to, to go make inquiries from about menstruation. So Akeshin Kenya saw this as a need and decided to start engaging the community members through uh, local celebrities, through music and art to normalize the discussion that uh, comes around menstruation because there's so much taboo around menstruation that uh, girls, uh, girls can stay in the house the whole four or three days and uh, miss out on school. So we decided to start having those discussions with community members and with the girls and uh, also supporting the girls with the menstrual product and uh, teach, teaching them how to store their reusable sanitary towels so that anytime they're having their periods, they have the period product and, and do not have to exchange uh, uh, sex for pads uh, because they can now, they're now well empowered to store their own sanitary towels. And uh, the Akishin Kenya also provided a water tank so they're able to wash their sanitary towels in a clean, with clean water. And they're also able to wash their hands and maintain body hygiene anytime they're menstruating. Um, another thing we've also continually done is talk to community leaders. These are chiefs, assistant chiefs, and opinion leaders in the community to embrace the concept of menstruation because it is from that concept that uh, the human life comes up. So we need to embrace it and have those dis discussions around menstruation with all the community members irrespective of their sex. The next slide, please. Uh, another project Akeshin Kenya has is uh, the sexual and reproductive health and rights training. Um, we noticed that uh, despite giving girls sanitary towels, they would still go out and get pregnant and some of them will even try and uh, conduct and safe abortions. So we saw that there was a challenge and there was a need to educate girls on uh, what, are, what are their rights? Uh, how are they supposed to react when someone asks them for sex? And what are the available uh, places where they can go to, to seek help in case they want to have a family planning or uh, try, try out contraceptives? There's a lot of taboo also around contraceptive use, and uh, we use this uh, SRH as training to just empower the girls with knowledge on uh, these are the family method, family planning methods available in the market. These are their side effects. This is how they're used. This is where you can go to get them. And in case a girl is pregnant, we have referral hospitals where we tell them. There's, there's a youth friendly hospital around here. You can go there and seek professional help because we can only provide the information. If you go to this hospital, you can get the service. If you go to this other service provider, in case you're pregnant, you can be helped. Uh, even though abortion is still a touchy issue in Kenya, uh, the government, uh, it's a quite, in, I don't know, confusing because the government can provide uh, after, after abortion care, but they do not support abortion. So most of the girls who have done abortion and safe abortion at home, we, help, we refer them to hospitals where they can get checked and get treated for post-abortion complications. And then um, another issue we are having is that uh, we have men in the community and uh, they're called Boda Boda Riders. Most of the time, they're the ones who violate the girls. So we brought them on board and had discussions on why they're supposed to use condoms when they're, they're having sex with the girls. We've also taught them how to use condoms. And we've also gone further to tell them clearly that uh, this is what the Kenyan law says in terms of you as adults engaging with, on, uh, with, on sex with the younger, with minors who are girls who are under the, below the age of 18. So the girls are also told that uh, anything, if someone touches you inappropriately, this is where you can report. And by inappropriately, we mean if someone touches your breast, if someone touches your private parts, if someone 
violates your right as a person, please come to us as a Akish in Kenya. If you can't come to us, all community leaders, these are the government officials, go to any government official's home that is close to you and report. They will guide you and uh, the law will take its appropriate co uh, course. And then uh, another important aspect, sex is a very touchy issue. So parents rarely discuss sex with their daughters and their sons. So Akisha in Kenya has also taken that up and is having discussions with parents in churches, in uh, public uh, meetings where the uh, government of officials have these public uh, forums where we're invited when we talk to parents on how best they can go around guiding their children, especially their daughters, on uh, on sex and and uh, uh, you know the sexual relationships. How can you know just advise your daughter that you can have a boyfriend in the opposite sex, which is normal, but this is how you can protect yourself from getting pregnant. And please be open with me as your mom, as your mother or as your father, and uh, I need to know who your boyfriend is. Uh, just so when you get pregnant, we can know how best to handle it. And then we have programs in school. So far, we are working with the three girls school. That is uh, St. Elizabeth Lureko School. That is our partner's, partner school. Matawas, uh, St. Romano's Matawa School and Muslim Girls High School in town. Uh, in total, we have, uh, we've reached a, a population of around 1,000 1, girls with uh, the sexual and reproductive health and rights training. Um, thank you, please, let's get to the next slide. And then uh, in, in order to ensure that uh, girls are safe and uh, their parents are engaged, because we come from a farming community, most of the parents of the girls we work with are farmers. And uh, our land has been degraded because we've planted sugarcane for the last maybe 40 years using commercial fertilizer. And the land is no longer as productive, especially after the sugar, uh, the sugar industry in Kenya collapsed. So we, 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 we train parents on how they can rejuvenate their soils so that they can get better yield. And uh, this is very impressive because part of the girls we've trained, we've uh, sponsored on the Acacia Kenya Scholarship, come back to give back to the community through this organic farming training. So the girls take up the mantle to train the farmers in the community and they train them in the local language so the farmers can understand really well. And we make sure that the, 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 the training is practical because the girl demonstrates and then the parents or farmers also do exactly what the girl has, has done. And in case there's any disparity, she corrects them in uh, using the local language. And that way they're able to understand very well what they're supposed to do when they go back home to their farms. And we encourage the parents to help their daughters keep vegetable gardens, small kitchen gardens, where they can plant vegetables for family use and the surplus is sold to the community so the girls can get some money to buy reusable sanitary towels. And we also train the farmers on value addition. For example, we train the farmers how to make a, a pineapple jam, how to make yogurt from milk in their cows. We also train them that if you have surplus, this is how you can package your produce and sell to the market. Uh, the next slide, please. I think I have like five minutes. Um, and then uh, in uh, March 2020, uh, lockdown such that people could not move from place to place. And unfortunately, there was high rain, right, rains in this region. And uh, some families in the community were displaced. And thanks to IWC, uh, who helped us fundraise, we were able to visit some families and uh, you know just share with them masks because they, they were displaced from their homes and had to move into schools in the area around, uh, around Mumias. So we were able to support those families with, uh, with soap. And we were also able to support the women in those 
facilities with uh, sanitary towels and masks for their children. We, these, uh, we were able to reach at least uh, 200 families which were displaced with uh, these facilities. And we're also able to distribute uh, sanitary towels to girls during the pandemic. Because even though the Kenyan government has a, a, a program where they issue uh, sanitary towels to girls while, they, while they're in school, during the corona lockdown, the girls were not able to access these sanitary towels because they're only available to girls while, while they're in school. So we were also, as part of our COVID response, we were also able to share sanitary towels with the girls. And we also had buckets, also courtesy of IWC. We were also able to give uh, food buckets to some families in the community, especially for the girls who were sponsored by Kesha in Kenya because they come from very needy families. So we were also able to share this with them. Apart from that, we worked with the Red Cross staff on the ground to train people in the community how to wash their hands and how they can keep safe and how to make tippy taps. Apart from that, we also distributed water buckets where families could uh, at least have clean water and soap to wash their hands anytime they're at home. And uh, for those who are not able to get the, the buckets, we taught them how to make tippy taps and how to make locally lo local soap so they could wash their hands with soap. And as a result, uh, the community leaders were very impressed with uh, how we assisted them reduce the spread of COVID-19 in our community. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so through the, the Kishin Kenya organization, we have been able to do the following. Uh, this is a summary of, of our, our impact to the community. Akisha in Kenya built a dormitory at St. Elizabeth Lureko Girls High School that is hosting 120 girls. And this guarantees them uh, you know, to stay in school throughout the school year and avoid getting in contact with men who, you know, could, who would drop them on their way to school and would also just confuse them so that they don't go, come to school and instead you know, try and get married. And uh, also, as I've said before, uh, Akesha in Kenya reached more than 200 families during, COVID, during our COVID-19 response project. And then uh, on our menstrual project, we've reached over 500 girls with reusable sanitary towels. And then through partnership with other local organizations, we've been able to you know, uh, be part of the team that spearhead Women, uh, women's equality issues, and also come up with policies within the Kakamega County. Like recently we had the sexual and reproductive health policy where we were able to add in our voice and it, uh, it has now been passed and needs implementation by the county government. So through partnership with other local organizations, that is what we've been able to do. And then uh, I think as a major, major thing we've done as a Kesha in Kenya is that we have improved the outcome of families who, especially by educating their girls from disadvantaged families, and as such, they're now empowered because once you empower one family member with one person who is employed in a family, they're able to give back and ensure that their siblings can also pursue education and become empowered. This means that when this girl, girl also gets married, she's going to have a positive impact in the family she's getting married to. And uh, as a result, her own children will also be educated. And then uh, just as a, as, a, uh, as a way of making sure that the girls at St. Elizabeth Loreco High School stay in school, even though some of them do not receive a sponsorship, we make sure that we pay the school fees in bulk in first term, and the school is able to purchase all the needs the school needs. For example, food, they can pay for electricity, they can pay for water, and they can pay the, the, the subordinate, subordinate staff through the money as a, we pay them as a fees for Kenyan Kenya students. This way, the money at once as school fees can.
So it's like a down and such as other people's lives. Hi, Philly. Um, I, I, Noel, thank you for that wonderful presentation. And I would like to, as, as I was listening, I would like to add to what the Secretary General said, because what I learned from your story is that empowered girls uh, lead to empowered women, but it leads to an empowered community for, for providing a better life. And, and thank you for sharing your story with us today. Um, and now for, for our next presentation, we're going to move north in the world and maybe a little west, I think, to uh, Transylvania, where we will be hearing from Gisela Naj um, about a leadership development program that she led or that she was instrumental in, I will say. Um, Gisela has been active in IWC since the first convocation in Houston in 2009. She is currently the vice president of UNOS, the National Association of Unitarian Women of Romania, and is a current IWC board member. Gisela was the president of the IWC's second international gathering held in Transylvania in 2012. Following that event, she has been instrumental in engaging young and middle-aged women in congregational life and creating a comprehensive leadership program for women in Transylvania and in partnership with IWC. She has a master's degree in mental health and has also been helping Transylvanian women suffering from complex trauma. So, Gizi, may we hear from you. Thank you, Phyllis. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I will talk to you about women's leadership trainings in Transylvania. So let's see where do we leave. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> the previous one, please. <laughs> Let's go first uh, into Europe. So we live in Europe in a small country. Its name is Romania. Uh, and next, next slide, please. In Romania, we live, uh, Romania uh, has three regions. We live in the middle in Transylvania where they are, um, are living, um, a diverse and uh, multi-ethnic uh, uh, popul population together. So Romanians, Hungarians, Saxons, and Roma. Next slide, please. So let's start uh, my presentation with the question, why do we need leadership trainings for women? Next, please. Uh, we women are much more susceptible to various effects than men. Take a look at this picture, please. Have you ever wondered how many positive and negative effects have we to cope with? And uh, how do you think the person fears in the middle? Uh, what do you think? Is it clear for the person how to cope with so many effects? and so many, so many stressors. And there is not listed everything. And this is also much more than a person is able to cope with. These effects can hit us like positive stress, distress, or toxic stress. And in addition to all of these, we are overheld by incorrect and correct information on the internet and in the media. We need a filter to navigate the stream of information. Education is the only key to find a way out. For adult women living in families 
and mainly in the countryside, our leadership training was almost the only option available for to learn about all of these things to, and to get a special education. Next, please. How did we start? At the, the leadership school for uh, Transylvanian women rose out of the action planning done at the second international convocation of Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist women in 2012 in Transylvania. This was followed by a survey in uh, 2013. We distributed 300 questionnaires among Unitarian women in Transylvania. The pilot program took place in 2014, followed by four additional leadership training sessions conducted in 2014 and 2015. Each session, which took place over a weekend, involved over 40 women from all over Transylvania. Next, please. In 2016, we involved another NGO too, the Village Caretaker Organization. Men and young girls were also attending this training. <clears throat> Next, please. Next slide, please. At the three days training, uh, it's okay, previous, um, is about uh, working to, together with village caretakers. Yes, at the three days trainings, we covered economics, macro and micro housekeeping, family economic management, how to make a family budget, and how to start on our businesses, personality development, spirituality, resilience building, and leadership. We included always some practical sessions. For example, teams created their own community projects accor uh, according to specific guidelines and purposes. In small groups, they designed the house of their dreams. They tried to walk in each other's shoes, etc. Many of the participants never spoke publicly in a community. Here they learn how to stand in front of a group of people and talk about their plans, dreams, and how to act. The curriculum included leadership skills, personal skills, community capacity building, team building, and conflict resolution, entrepreneurship, as well as basic grant writing skills. At the beginning, we did not find a handbook. Next slide, please. We did not find a handbook which was possible, possible to uh, convert according to our cultural, economic backgrounds and goals. We invited the best professionals with, with high qualification and built our own path and we succeeded. Some of attendees started their own businesses. In 2016, we ended our trainings. But in 2017, we received many requests to continue the trainings. The organizing committee came together and started to planning again. Our focus turned to the question, is domestic violence still taboo in Transylvania? This is why the leadership school sessions continued in 2018, next slide, please, uh, 2019 and 2020 by focusing strictly on one issue, domestic violence, particularly intimate partner violence. Domestic violence includes violence against intimate partner, children, 
family members with disabilities and uh, elderly family members. According to statistics, one in 10 women in Romania is a victim of domestic violence. Next, please. I can best express our goals in three words, learning, understanding, and acting. Many of us do not have the courage to talk about our problems, maybe because it is forbidden by faith, or maybe because we have no other choices, maybe because we have no income of our own and we are financially tied to our husbands. Maybe because many of us still believe that women should be known by silence and obedience. This is why the impact of leadership trainings might be a milestone in life of many of participants. One training was built on the other. The new session always started with a summary of the previous one. The new participants received the full material of the previous trainings. Slide, next slide, please. At the last three trainings, participants understood that verbal, economic, ethnic, emotional, spiritual violence endangers our health, that the name of women cannot be silence and obedience, that our voices must be heard and understood, and um, that domestic violence is no longer taboo subject. Uh, next, please. In total, 350 women have attended our trainings. Talking about impact or outcome of the trainings, I repeat what I mentioned earlier Then some of the attendees started their own businesses. Others are present in community leadership at the local council or at an NGO. Next, please. Uh, another uh, income uh, of the leadership trainings is the leadership handbook and uh, the informational flyer. We distributed the flyers to raise awareness as well as give helpful information, including the national domestic violence hotline. Next slide, please. Attendees received certificate of completion, but a speaker certificate of recognition. The trainings were organized with support of International Women's Convocation, IWC, UU funding a program grant, Unitarian Women's Association in Romania, UNUS, Hungarian Unitarian Church and BGA, Bethlehem Gabor Founds. Uh, it is an organization from Hungary. How do we continue? UNOS will soon be organizing an ecumenical Zoom event with uh, the IWC. This will be the first event in virtual space in which we invite women's organizations from all, all denominations to talk about domestic violence. We consider this to be one of the, the, the long-term outcomes of our leadership trainings. We hope that this initiative will also act as a call for women's organizations in other denominations. We are planning a recall Zoom meeting for all leadership attendees. So do we continue? Yes, 
despite the current insecure, confusing, fearful pandemic situation, we are planning to act. Next slide, the last one, please. Thank you for your attention. And, jo and Gisela, thank you for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I had heard your story before, but hearing it anew in all the detail um, was just wonderful today. And uh, again, thank you. Uh, from Romania, we are going to travel. I think we go east, maybe, uh, to India to an area called Meghalaya, uh, India in, in the Kasi Hills, where we are going to hear from Dr. Rika Lamar. Um, Dr. Rika, can we hear you? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Am I clear? Oh, yes, we can now. And, oh, and thank we, God. Are, we are so pleased to have you uh, <laughs> from Meghalaya. So let me. I want to yes. tell you a little bit about Dr. Dr. Rika. She is a medical doctor, a social activist, and she is the founder of, and Dr. Rika, would you please say the name of your foundation so I get it right in the pronunciation? It's called uh, Manbha Foundation. Okay. And it is an organization, as I understand, working in the field of drug abuse, HIV, and the health and welfare of women and children. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Rika has worked on several projects under the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes and other organization. She has served as vice chairperson of the Meghalaya State Commission for Women and as a member of the Committee on Prevention of Sexual Abuse of Women in Workplaces. She has worked closely with the women's wing of the Northeast India Unitarian Union as a resource person and keynote speaker for several programs focusing on reproductive health, gender equity, and violence against women. And Dr. Rika, we ask you to share the story of the women and what, what you have done in Meghalaya. Thank you, Phyllis. So can I have uh, the screen uh, sharing of my PowerPoint presentation on the screen? Can I have my PowerPoint shared? Yes, thank you. So uh, a very warm welcome to everyone who is present here today for uh, this uh, panel discussion. So uh, I would like to start by showing you the slide of my state, Meghalaya. Next slide, please. So Meghalaya is a small state in the Northeast of India, as you can see. It is tucked away in the hills of the eastern sub Himalayas. And I think it is one of the most beautiful states in India. Next. So, uh, briefly, would just like to tell you about Meghalaya. It is also called as the abode of clouds. And uh, Meghalaya got its statehood on the 21st January. 1972. So the population of Meghalaya as of 2020 is estimated to be 3.65264 million. And it covers an area of approximately 22,430 square kilometers with a length to breadth ratio of three is to one. Next. So we are three tribes in Meghalaya. That is the Kasi tribes, the Garo, and the Jaintia. And I belong to the Jaintia tribes. 
So uh, just a little bit uh, to show you that nature has blessed Meghalaya with abundant rainfall, sunshine, virgin forests in high plateaus, tumbling waterfalls, crystal clear rivers, meandering streamlets, exotic caves, and also hospitable people. Next, please. So uh, it is very important for me now to stress on our society and culture because we have a unique society because we, the Khasi Society of Meghalaya is a society commonly known as matrilineal where the authority, the titles, the, the title, the inheritance, the residence after marriage and succession are traced through the female line. So here in our society, we have the youngest daughter of the family called the Khaddu, who inherits all ancestral property. And the mother's surname is taken by the children. And as I said, after marriage, husband live in the mother-in-law's homes. Next slide. So, because of the matrilineal society that the Khasis follow, it is presumed by everyone that women in Meghalaya are well aware and knowledgeable about their social, economic, political, or psychological status and establish their rights along with men in their society. They also presume to have access to better education, ownership of property, authority in their family and society, and that they are heads of the families and decide what to be done or not. Next, please. Uh, women in matrilineal societies are entrusted with enormous rights over property and important duties in performing family rights, but the actual ownership is not theirs. Certain customary laws and practices put women at vulnerable positions whereby they are not able to access their rights. Among the Khasipnar's household responsibilities are shared between the maternal uncle and the father in matters affecting the clan or the family, such as the arrangement of marriages, management of ancestral property and the performance of religious duty, it is the uncle who makes the decision, though generally in consultation with other members of the family. Women do not have the right to dispose of property on their own. They are just keepers of the property. The customary marriage law of the Khasi society consists of cohabitation of two people and offers no legal binding. So the permissiveness of the customary law has led to easy desertion of the wife and children by the husband, thus leaving the women with multiple burdens. Women cannot claim maintenance if deserted by the husbands. So the customs and practices of a community do not provide women the social space to participate in decision making. And we also see that Khasi society does not permit participation of women in political uh, uh, areas, even especially in the traditional councils. And uh, especially in the urban areas, women are viewed more as agents of reproduction and witnesses women's primary role as producing heirs necessary for the continuity of the family, clan, and lineage. Next, please. So discrimination and inequality exists. We see that violence and crimes against women are on the rise and quality services and opportunities are still lacking behind for the women of Meghalaya. It is very challenging for the women to establish credibility in a culture 
that is deeply conflicted about whether, when, and how they should exercise authority. Women define themselves in relation to gender stereotypes and often feel ambivalent about leaving the comfort, zone, uh, comfort of roles in which they have been assigned to by society because being, doing so means moving towards an uncertain outcome. Next slide, please. So keeping in mind how, what is the status of women in Meghalaya? Now, before we come into the leadership school, I would just like to talk about the collaboration between the Seng and Thay Unitarian Union of Northeast India, of which I am a member of, and the IWC. So in February 2009, the date of the first international UU Women's Convocation, which was held at Houston, three representatives of the Seng and Thay, that is the women's wing of the Unitarian Union of Northeast India, came to the convocation, one of whom, Dr. Krim Limon Nongbri, became the representative of the Kasi Unitarians on the ICAUW board. Then, during the second international convocation, uh, I cannot get this name right, but this was in Transylvania, held in October 2012. So Dr. C. Nongbri, sorry for the mistake, spoke on a panel about developing women's leadership for peace and multicultural understanding. So it was during the second international convocation that the leaders of the Second Tay and the IWC thought about launching a leadership development program in Unitarian congregations of Northeast India. So the two organizations signed an agreement of collaboration on December the 20th, 2014, in Shillong, the capital of Meghalaya. Next, please. So here uh, we see the uh, photos of the signing of the uh, MOU between the two organizations in which I think, uh, whether it's not too clear, I think you can see Zofie there from the IWC. We have our president, and the secretary of the second day. And here we have the a photo of the first and second UU women's con uh, convocations in Houston, February 2009, and Transylvania, October 2012. Next, please. So, the leadership training for women in Meghalaya. As we all know, the first step to empowerment of women is integrating leadership into the women's core identity. And the goal is to empower women by developing their leadership skills. So what was the objective of this project that we had in mind? It was to help women gain leadership skills and attitudes to enable them to take control of their own lives and also to help women unlock their potential to make their voices heard and step into leadership roles in their communities. Next, please. So we look at now, what were the areas of focus uh, of the trainings that we wanted uh, to have in order to help our women? So we looked at gender and gender equity. Here, we spoke in the training or rather uh, the main uh, topics that were given under the, this uh, session was on gender and gender equality, the gender identification, gender discrimination, gender as a social contributor, how to bring gender equality in our society, sensitization of men folk, and changing the myths and also doing away with stereotyping and gender roles that is created by society. Then the second session 
is on was on sexual and reproductive health. And here, uh, I had taken the session for all the trainings, and it I found it really uh, shocking to know that women, especially in the rural areas, did not have any knowledge about their bodies. When I asked them, do you know why do you menstruate? They did not have any answer. They did not, they were not aware of what was the meaning behind menstruating. They had no knowledge about their bodies and their uh, functions, the reproductive functions on menstruation. On, and they had various myths attached to uh, the reproductive health. For example, like not having a bath during menopause, uh, during uh, menstruation, sorry. Myths about contraceptive, like sterilization, and that uh, it would cause them to become mad or uh, psychotic if they had sterilization done. And also, of course, we had uh, the various religious uh, barriers which did not uh, allow for uh, contraceptive. And as I said earlier, women are meant to be uh, pro uh, to be uh, increasing the number of children, especially uh, females or uh, girls, so as to uh, increase the clan and to maintain the name of their clan. And then we also had a session on personal development skills, such as self-awareness, motivation, and effective communication. Because we see our women here are really timid. They are, uh, you know, have a low self-esteem of themselves. Whenever we have any meetings, uh, especially in the rural areas, if it is a public meeting, it is always the men folk who, who talk. The women would always keep quiet. They do not voice what is within them. They feel uh, scared or perhaps it is not there within their right uh, or within their power to say what their needs are. So uh, this personal development, such as self-awareness, motivation and communication skills is we felt a very important session to take. And then the other session was on leadership skills. That is decision-making skills, which is very important for them starting right from their own homes, in their own villages, in their towns, and even at their uh, workplaces. Then we also look at how they can use these leadership skills to get more involved into the political scenario so as to be get the ability or the chance to make policies. Uh, then we look at violence against women. We see that this is a big issue for women here in Meghalaya because there is a, an increase in uh, the crimes against women and especially on domestic violence. So this, uh, we taught them about what is domestic violence. Who do you go to help? Who do you go to help to? How women in the village can help other women who are facing violence and also on the safety of women and girls. Then last, we spoke about uh, economic empowerment in the trainings on uh, showing them how women face uh, disparity or inequality in wages from the counterpart that is the men and how women are able to get only low skilled work and not the high skilled work. Reasons being that maybe a woman uh, would be bearing children, would be taking too much leave, that is maternity leave, and is too busy with household work, etc. Then also under this economic empowerment, they were taught about self-help groups, 
on vocational trainings, the different types of vocational trainings on microcredit system and setting up of small businesses on where to go, how to avail all these uh, facilities for them. So these six uh, important sessions we felt were the areas of focus required for the trainings. Next, please. So here is a photograph of the first leadership training that we had. So the first of the six sessions of the leadership development program, this was conducted on the 30th and 31st of October, 2015. It was a residential uh, where all the participants from the different parts of the Kasi Hills came and stayed at the Unitarian Church, Madan Laban, Shillong. And then we had a second session on the 18th and 19th of December, which also was residential at the same venue. So here we have pictures of our second Thai president and the secretary, and these are the various participants who took part in this. Next, please. Here we see photos of the participants and the activities that was carried out during the trainings. Here you can see some uh, group photos of women uh, discussing and having group sessions on various topics. And we have the facilitators and the trainees taking uh, them, uh, giving them uh, the knowledge that they require. So this is, uh, if you see the church, that is the Madan Laban church. And uh, if you see at the far end, we have the uh, inauguration of the first session by our Reverend, who's Reverend uh, Derek Parrott, who's the president of the UUNEI. Next slide, please. So overall, the leadership training program was conducted in a course of five months, which consisted of six sessions of a full day workshop. We had resource people who are all very experienced and knowledgeable in their field of work. As you see, the first session, as I mentioned earlier, was on the 30th and 31st October, 2015. The second was on December 2015. And then we had the third one on 9th January 2016. The 30th uh, Jan 2016, we held the first, fourth session. On 20th Feb 2016 was the fifth session. And on 5th March 2016, we had the sixth session. So these are are very learned and uh, experienced uh, uh, resource persons who came from uh, different uh, offices from the banks, like the Meghalaya Cooperative Apex Bank, then from the agriculture department. And then we also uh, had uh, people from the universities. And of course, we had our reverence, Reverend Darihun, and Reverend Nang Roy Suting, who have had a lot of experience in leadership training, especially for the youth. Next slide, please. So what was the outcome, outcomes of this leadership training? We see that the participating women have shown more confidence, have become more expressive of their views, more participative and learned how to work together. And at the end of the six trainings, the women felt that they gained more knowledge and they could dispel their myths and clarify their doubts. As facilitators, we identified several women who demonstrated a range of leadership skills and abilities to effectively ignite change. A significant number of women who are ready to take on leadership roles in their women's associations, congregations, and communities, 
women who are prepared to make a positive difference in their communities. We also saw the increased collaboration with grassroots women's organizations, the governmental organizations and NGOs, and other nonprofit organizations on a national and international level. In one village in Bhoi district, some women who were participants of the leadership training informed us about cases of domestic violence. They had formed a group amongst themselves and had helped these women who were victims of domestic violence and also with the knowledge that they had on uh, how to go about helping them, whom to seek help and where to go. They had given this information and helped them to uh, get them legal help. So uh, also following this, this leadership session, the Senkente also took up uh, along with the help of IWC. Uh, we had the awareness programs on violence against women, a series of them. And also now we have a new project that uh, is in the pipeline that is helping women during the COVID times. So these are all follow-ups of uh, the outcomes rather of this leadership training. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges that we face during this, uh, these sessions was that during the first session that was held on October, 2015, some of the women who were teachers and students had ongoing exams. And so they were not able to complete the training and some could not attend. Then attendance of the women was lower than we had expected. We had an average of 30 women only, though we had planned to have for 50 women. And many women could not attend the workshop since the villages are, were far away from the training centers and it was difficult for them to uh, spend two days as most of them are working in the fields and are our daily wage workers. So it was not possible for them to spend two days for this training. So uh, I would like to end my uh, presentation in gratitude or in the Kasi word, Kublai. Our heartfelt gratitude to the IWC and UUFP funding panel for all its efforts and endeavors to guide and support us for the leadership school project. The core committee members of the second day who've inspired, guided, taught, shared and helped us throughout the whole program to make it a successful, successful one. Officials of UUNEI who are always behind us in all our endeavors and have equally participated and supported us. Resource persons whose expertise had inspired all concerned present in the programs. Last but not the least, sincere thanks to all the participants who have attended the leadership school program. So thank you very much, everyone, for your patient listening. Wow, and thank you, Dr. Rika, for your presentation. Again, I learned a great deal from listening to you. And uh, there are so many takeaways. I think I need to go back and listen. Uh, the way you ended it was very special because in each of the programs um, that we are hearing about today, it does take a lot of people working together. And I, I think that is one of the things that we can bring to this. It takes a community uh, to empower and change and to listen. And so I thank you. We do have some time left. And um, so I would like to just ask one a question of each of the participants. If, uh, in, in looking back on their program, could they share this, just the personal story of what it means to just one participant? There doesn't have to be names or anything, just a, a, 
on, on the individual level, what it has meant to somebody in your program. Um, if you could, I'd like to ask you. Um, I don't know who, is, is Gizi, could you share something? Okay, so um, as every be beginning, the leadership trainings beginning was uh, not, wasn't without obstacles, even by women, but by some of women, uh, the, you know, the information about uh, leader, our leadership trainings, what uh, we are initiating to start, was received with uh, strange reactions asking me that what do you want do you want a, a feminist movement in transylvania it is not fashionable anymore so uh, this type of uh, reactions and uh, not only from men from women too and but um, you know i have many stories i would like to take out one name um i will tell her name uh, it doesn't matter but uh, i asked her permission so she is ildiko balash Fulop. she attended all our leadership trainings and uh, she, uh, she still uses all the materials uh, she put together and um, she started her own business uh, it is a lifestyle counseling and the massage business uh, and uh, she founded the young wing of um, uh, women association at our church and uh, she became very active at uh, at our church so in spite, she has a family, she has two children and uh, she has a job at uh, the county hospital. Uh, she's a busy, very busy person, but, uh, and she's very proud of, uh, of uh, uh, leadership trainings, our leadership trainings. And I would like to, may I add one more story, please, without yes. name? Yes. Um, one of uh, participants in 2018, you know, the last uh, three, uh, how I mentioned last uh, three trainings were about uh, domestic violence. And um, one of uh, participants, she was active, but she was uh, very silent. She didn't speak about herself at all. Uh, when uh, the training was over, uh, she, thanked with tears in, in her eyes. She went home and some weeks later, I received a letter from her uh, where she was written about her life story. She said that she suffered all forms of domestic violence in more than 10 years uh, in her marriage. Uh, then she divorced. And, you know, when she divorced, and this is a very, very uh, normal reaction in Transylvania, when somebody divorced, you know, the, the, the relatives and friends come, oh, why did you do, uh, it is not a good example for your uh, children or child, she had a daughter. And, uh, you know, uh, the, her story was repeated in, uh, in the life of her daughter, lives of her daughter. She divorced too. And when she divorced, you know, the, the friends and relatives came again. Yes, because you gave a bad example. So can you imagine the, the, the feelings of this, uh, this lady? Uh, so she got some illnesses and uh, you know, what was very, um, for me, very, very impressive. She said, uh, Gizzy, I can never thank enough for this training because after 40 years, I could forgive myself. 
So during 40 years, she couldn't forgive and she accused herself uh, as well as many uh, people uh, in her surrounding. So <laughs> uh, I suppose that um, the others have to tell some stories too. Oh, oh, Gizzi, thank you. Um, it, it, these are life changing. Um, and I think the fact that she shared it with you is powerful. I, I have the feeling from listening to our stories that this has been magnified in maybe in a lot of other of the women's lives whom each of you have touched and mm -hmm. we don't hear about them. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Noelle or Dr. Rico, do you have this? Can you share a story uh, so, with us? Um, Phyllis? Yes. Noelle would like to Noelle would like you to repeat the question because she didn't understand it the first time. Oh, okay, Noelle. Um, it, do, in the work that you did and the girls that who have gone through your program or even the families that you have helped, can you tell us on a personal level a story of how one of the participants' lives have been changed or something that stands out to you to, to just personalize it in terms of your of the story. Not yours, but one of your participants. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm sure so, you know uh, have, I'm sure you have many special <laughs> memories. Yeah, but I have this many, one many special stories through the, the more than 10 years of work. So I'll, I'll tell you the story of uh, Saumu. I'll not say her second name. So Saumu was born uh, out of a relationship between, not a relationship, her mom was mentally unstable. She was mentally unwell. And uh, according to the Nuya culture, uh, she was considered, uh, I would say, a mad person because she would just roam the streets and uh, she will tag Saumu alone, along, and uh, they will sleep on uh, in town on the streets, and they will move from market to market, and she will not let go of uh, Saumu, her daughter. So she moved to a town, one of the... Noel, I think we've lost your sound. I, I'm, I'm, I cannot hear you, Noel. Can anybody else? No, no, I cannot hear. Sorry. Oh, no, Noel, I still, I don't know what the problem is. I still cannot hear you. Um, Yes, uh, this is Josie. So Noel's internet connection is, um, yeah, it's uh, breaking up. So maybe we could uh, ask Dr. Rika and then come back to Noel. Okay. Uh, so I will ask Dr. Rika to share if she would. And, and Noel, we will try to come back to you. Dr. Rika? Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, one of uh, the participants, I had asked for her permission. Uh, uh, this is uh, Miss Panshisha Malimgap. She's a uh, school teacher who teaches in a primary school, the Margaret Bar Memorial School, uh, run by our church only in Laban, Shillong. So she attended all the six leadership training sessions. And uh, she has shared that the leadership training has benefited her in many ways. So she said that she has gained knowledge in several matters concerning women. And she has also started questioning her own attitudes about gender roles and stereotypes. You know, she also has had a mind change in her perceptives, uh, her attitudes, her knowledge and behavior. She is very impressed with the Sengente and she's very motivated to be a part of it. She has uh, also imparted this uh, 
certain knowledge with her peers that are teachers, you know. And uh, also she is a volunteer uh, for a charitable clinic that I run there in La Sotun. So now uh, we usually have a, a lot of women uh, who come in and children. So she has started talking to uh, especially pregnant women and encouraging them to go for antenatal care and the benefits of antenatal care. She also talks to the adolescent girls, to teaching them about you know, their bodies and uh, what is going on with them. And uh, also we see that, you know, because uh, many of our women have alcoholic husbands. So uh, she talks to these women and uh, she refers the, the husbands uh, to me for detoxification and treatment and uh, continue to counsel these uh, women so that, you know, because the primary problem is actually alcohol uh, in most of our domestic violence cases. So I feel that she is one of the, you know, uh, uh, outstanding example of the success of our leadership uh, program. Thank you. Yes, yes. And, and thank you for sharing that, that one because uh, it is the leadership training schools are very life-changing and as well as societal changing. And uh, these stories are important. I would like to go back to Noel because I was interested in the story that she was sharing. And I wondered, do Noel, do, do we have sound from you? No, no, no. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. So um, we are nearing the end of our time. Uh, it says that we only have two minutes left, uh, although we might not get kicked off right away. So I am going to ask Karen and Jofi if there were any other questions that came in that you would like to uh, be addressed to our, our presenters. Karen and Jofi. I, yeah, oh, there's Jofi. But go ahead, yes, go ahead, Karen. Oh, well, I didn't see anything um, different, did you? Uh, no, actually, I did have a question for Noelle and she answered it in the chat box and I copied the answer um, for everyone to see um, related to the Boda Boda writers. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think there were any other questions that came through in the chat box. Okay, so um, uh, again, I want to thank um, all of you. Oh, um, Phyllis. Yes. Um, Tina has a question. Um, I would like to know how the panelists benefited from their international connection. Um, okay, that is that's a um, a question. I will uh, ask the Gisi or Noel or Dr. Vika. Uh, how the question is how you benefited from the international connections. Each, I know each of your program is local and you did a wonderful job of placing it in the context of your own community, but how has it, how has the international connection helped? I would like to give a very quick answer and uh, thanks to Tina. Uh, you know, um, because of uh, the international international connection was available for us. This is why we could invite Tina and she could be our presenter two times at our leadership trainings. So uh, now we can we can see the the direct connection uh, of IWC and uh, our national. Um, uh, programs, you know, of course, our uh, program was in uh, our uh, language in Hungarian language and uh, Tina's presentation was translated, but it was a wonderful, uh, so it, it um, reflects how important 
and um, how useful is our working together. Uh, probably Dr. Rika would like, uh, I would have more, but uh, because we have short time. Dr. Rika, uh, would you like? Yes. Uh, yes, I <laughs> really, uh, this is uh, really uh, my way, giving me a chance to express my, uh, you know, uh, gratefulness and uh, really uh, the opportunity that I have had uh, through it, my international uh, networking because I was able to join, uh, I was invited for the third IWC convocation in Monterey, California. And this was really my first trip uh, outside of India. And uh, I met so many wonderful women and we shared so much and <clears throat> really it gave me a sense of confidence as an individual to be able to speak in an international forum. And also I feel pride in uh, being able to, uh, you know, uh, talk about my people, my the women uh, here in uh, Meghalaya and what are the problems that they share. And I also have, I would like to say a special thank you for uh, IWC, uh, you know, for supporting us uh, for our programs, because if not for their uh, financial support and other forms of support, we would not be able to have this leadership uh, program and the programs that follow. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Okay. And Noel, can we hear? Can we hear now? Uh, Noel, are you able to come back on? Um, Until Noah comes back, I would like to add one more thing. So in 2012, when we organized the second international convocation, you know, um, maybe it's, it is uh, uh, difficult to imagine uh, the, the fact that we could bring the world to Transylvania, to Transylvanian women, more than 600 women attended on the uh, uh, second day of the of the convocation at the culture palace so um, they could meet uh, this uh, more than 600 women could meet uh, women from other countries for, from other continents and could talk to them so it was something uh, really uh, pioneer uh, so in the history of unitarism in Transylvania. So. Okay, thank you. Now, Noel, uh, you came back on. Can we, we want to give you an opportunity to speak. Um, oh, maybe, I, yeah, I don't know if she's still having trouble. Maybe Jofi, you could read her answer from the chat box. Yes, actually, she just texted uh, me, uh, I mean, sent a, a message to me that her network is really poor. She can only text. So, um, and I can read then the, what she wrote in the, in the chat box. Acacia in Kenya was able to reach 200 families with COVID-19 response project courtesy of the financial support from IWC. Secondly, Acacia in Kenya programs are able to run consistently courtesy of support from our American friends and supporters. We are grateful for the collaboration and support. Okay, I think our time has come to an end. Um, we will be kicked off of this platform very shortly as I understand it. So. I would like to bring it to an end and end. And again, thank you to um, Noel and, and Gizi and Dr. Rika. And thank you for the work that you have done that you could bring to us today and for your presentation. I think I speak for all of those who are listening. We have learned a lot and we have been inspired by the work that you do. And we look forward to a continuing collaboration with you. And so I thank you all uh, for attending. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me too. Okay.